Bless you. PA here, Pastor Adam Bird, and I'm so pumped and excited that you'd spend your Sunday morning here with us at Every Nation New Jersey. And listen, we are going to dive into our series we've just called A Beautiful Mess. It's a journey through the book of 1 Corinthians. Uh, but before we do that, I need us to, to brush up on a little history, all right? And are you familiar with the Battle of Marathon? This is back in about the 4th century B.C., and uh, the Persians actually uh, landed uh, in Greece, attacking the Greeks, and um, actually the Persians outnumbered uh, the Greeks four to one. And so the Greeks, they put up this valiant fight, uh, and in fact, against all odds at the Battle of Marathon, that when the, when the fighting was done, that there were some 6,000 Persians laid dead on the battlefield in only some 200 Greeks and the Persians, they sailed back home again. And after this epic, unthinkable victory, um, there was a, a, a man, a runner, Pheidippides, and uh, he was a, he was a, a, a warrior slash runner, and, and so his general sent Pheidippides back to Athens, the capital of Greece, to make this announcement. We won, we won. And so Pheidippides, he makes the 26 mile journey from Marathon all the way to Athens. And it was there that he announced to the crowd, we won, we defeated the Persians. And after the roar of the crowd, Pheidippides dropped dead. And so, and so what, what an amazing story. And, and with that, I'm sure you can put two and two together that to honor Pheidippides and the victory against the Persians, um, they, they actually created an Olympic game, a race, 26 miles, uh, that we now call a marathon, right? And so, so this is uh, this idea of a race, this this uh, athletic imagery, imagery. It would have resonated with uh, the Corinthians because they they hosted uh, these annual uh, games called the Isthmian Games, and, and they would, here the nations would compete against uh, one another. And so it was a huge uh, sporting port, right? And uh, and in First Corinthians chapter nine, verse twenty four, and, and this is going to set our stage for where we're going today. Paul. Is is going to say this do you not know that in a race all the runners won but only one receives the prize so run that you may obtain it i've called this message run to win and listen we have our our uh, children's ministers jason and marge garcia they actually ran the new york city marathon and i just kind of texted them i was like hey hey what in, in a word what did it feel like you for you to run the marathon and in jason uh, he says this he says it was extraordinary it was like we were running for something greater than ourselves and, and his wife marge uh, she she put it in one simple word she says i, I just felt fortified she she said, I realized after doing this, I can do difficult things. And listen, God has called you to run your race, this epic race. And Paul is going to appeal to us today. Hey, man, run to win, run to win. And so while we're stuttering 1 Corinthians, we're actually not going to be there today. We're actually going to be in the book of Acts chapter 11. You're going to get two sermons for the price of one because uh, this, this past week I, I felt compelled by the Lord to preach Acts 11 to my staff uh, to encourage us that, that we might win at God's calling on our life. And, and then uh, some of the staff, they suggested, you know what, you need to preach that to the church. So you're getting two sermons for the price of one today. Acts chapter 11, verses 23 to 20 because actually Saul or Paul had a running mate and his name was Barnabas and I believe Barnabas is going to give us the secret to to not just encouraging us to win but how to win and so Lord I pray you give us grace in Jesus name and so Acts chapter 11 is going to take place in a place called Antioch. And now, if you will, feel with me this, like, like Jerusalem, the gospel was spilling out uh, outside of Jerusalem until it actually, the gospel reaches Antioch and now the Greeks are beginning to be saved. And, and with this, the church is, is slowly and steadily beginning to grow and there's this odd mix of different ethnicities and cultures, kind of like the church 
every nation, <laughs> New Jersey, and this, this mishmash of, of ethnicities, cultures, and age groups are now united under the gospel. And get, catch this, is, is do you know that eventually Antioch would become uh, the missionary sending center uh, of the early church? And it would, uh, places like Philippi and Colossae, uh, these churches would be planted out of the church uh, of Antioch. And so, uh, and then here's the last cherry on top. Did you know at, at the church at Antioch, that was the starting point, the beginning, when people were called Christians. It means a little Christ. And I pray, pray that, that as we, as we uh, follow the example of Barnabas, that, that people will look at us and you go, that's a little Christ. That's a little Christ right there. And so let's read Acts chapter 11. It says this. It says, when he came and saw the grace of God. And so this is Barnabas. When he came and he saw the grace of God, he was glad and he exhorted them all to remain faithful to the Lord with steadfast purpose. For he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and of faith. And a great many people were added to the Lord. So Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul. And when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. For a whole year they met with the church and taught a great many people. And in Antioch the disciples were first called Christians. And so I, I want to break down some of these steps, these things that Barnabas did uh, to, to multiply the growth in Antioch. Notice this. It, number one is it begins with this. It says, he exhorted them. He exhorted them. That word ex, it, it means uh, thoroughly. And then hort, uh, it, it means to encourage, to thoroughly encourage. And so Barnabas, when he got there, he was just thoroughly encouraging people in their young faith. In fact, um, uh, you know that Barnabas wasn't his real name. His name was Joseph, but the disciples called him and renamed him Barnabas. It means the son of encouragement. Why? Because he was a man who exhorted people uh, thoroughly. And uh, just if I was to just observe uh, the world today, you know what? I, I feel as if humanity is suffocating, slowly uh, dying a, a slow death because the, the air we breathe today is toxic. And, and I'm not uh, talking about global warming or anything like that. I'm talking about like the air we breathe today. It's toxic with, with negativity cynicism, skepticism. It's like to hear anything positive, it's the last gasp of oxygen uh, we have. And uh, I remember when I was, uh, I was actually playing for Team USA and we were training in Colorado Springs, Colorado. And, and if you've ever been there, man, you know the altitude, is, it's unbelievably high. And I remember uh, when the plane landed, and I just went to baggage check and I'm trying to get my, my hockey bag and I'm, oh, I'm getting winded going from the airport terminal to the bus, man. I'm like, uh-oh, this is gonna be hard. Why? See, when you're at elevation, the air gets extremely thin. And I feel like today in this, this toxic world and culture we live in, the air is very, very thin. And, and hope, optimism, faith, it's just rare air nowadays. And I'm going to tell you this, man, everyone is hungry for more oxygen, more encouragement and exhortation in their life. Listen, everyone feels insecure, unsure of what tomorrow is going to hold, and I mean everybody. Don't believe all the Instagram trash and all that you see. Man, people are struggling and insecure. In fact, researchers, they have a name. They, they just call it imposter syndrome. And, and all of us walk in a sense of this imposter syndrome that, that we feel somewhat like a fake, like a failure. And we, we feel like, man, someone is just going to find me out as being a fraud one day, right? Um, do you know that sociologists uh, and psychologists, they tell us this, that do you know that you and I, we're going to think anywhere between 12 to 60,000 thoughts per day. And get this, 80% of those thoughts are negative. They're negative. We're just garbage collectors, and, and we just keep all these negative thoughts that are bombarding us. Uh, you know, the researchers also say this. Do you know, for, the, for every one negative word spoken over you, it takes five other positive words to order, in order to counterbalance that thing out, right? And so uh, recently I heard the, uh, a podcast from a woman named Kathy Heller, and Kathy Heller's a, a successful author and entrepreneur, and, but she had a really, really uh, jacked up childhood. 
And, um, and so she, she actually shares the story how, you know, she's been going through therapy and, and one of her therapists had her do this exercise. And, and so they had uh, Kathy, they said, now get one of the other students to, to role play and they're going to be you. And they sat this individual in a chair and now, now the, the therapist said, now Kathy, uh, I want you to, to speak to that person in the chair uh, uh, like they were you, okay? And, and what did your parents speak over your life? And she grabbed this pillow and she says, my dad would tell me, I hate your mom, I wanna leave her. And he puts, puts the pillow on the girl. And then he says, well, what would your mom say? My mom would say, uh, I, I don't wanna live anymore, I hate myself, and put another pillow. And then what did they say about you? Oh, you're, you're a failure and you're always gonna be one. And, and pillow after pillow was stacked uh, until you, you couldn't see the woman. You couldn't see her anymore. And the therapist asked Kathy, she's like, what are you going to do? And Kathy said, I, I got to get rid of the pillows. And then the therapist said this, I want you to walk over to yourself. And I want you to tell yourself, you don't have to live like that anymore. I'm coming to get you. And you know what? That, that's my prayer. Not like before I meet with anybody, I pray, oh God, Lord, fill me up with exhortation and encouragement. Lord, that I might be able to remove pillows off people's life. That, that I can say like Kathy Heller, hey, I'm coming to get you. Jesus is coming to get you, to speak encouragement and life over you. Do you know that encouragement, it really is the universal currency. Like wherever you go around the globe, people will, will receive the language uh, of encouragement. And, and listen, if you want to move the needle of your leadership, of your influence, of trust, man, just start speaking life and encouragement and exhortation over people. Man, it, it just, it's just like oxygen and people will follow you uh, and it, they just will. Uh, that's number one. Number two is this. He, notice that it says that he encouraged them uh, to remain in steadfast purpose, steadfast purpose. And man, I want to encourage you today, live your life on purpose. Live your life on purpose. The word purpose, it simply means to put forth or to aim. It's like you have a target now to shoot at. You're aiming your life at. And, and I, I love as we're approaching Black History Month that the, the story of George Washington Carver. And, you know, if you don't know that, man, he grew up during the time of slavery. And, and then, but get this, his mother, Susan, she would always put before him destiny and purpose because she, she would pray and speak over her son, little George. She would say, George, you're God's special child, and he has a special plan and a special purpose for your life. And that was her mantra. She kept speaking destiny, speaking purpose over his life. And, and we, as we know, he became one of the most brilliant minds our nation uh, has ever known. In fact, uh, George Washington Carver, he actually, he, uh, he's recorded as saying, uh, crying out to God and saying, God, reveal to me the mysteries of the universe, to which God responded, well, George, uh, you're a little too, uh, 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 little too small for that, so how about I unlock for you the mysteries of the peanut? And George Washington Carver is known to find over 300 uh, uses for the peanut. See, he was a man on a mission, a man with a purpose. And, and I think you would agree with me, like when you see a man or a woman on a mission, like with a purpose, like there's something that, that's very captivating, uh, something riveting about that individual. And so if you don't believe me, then I, I'll tell you the story of Captain Pete Mitchell. You might know him, AKA, as Maverick, right? And uh, if you haven't seen the movie Ma Maverick, shame on you, okay? But uh, you remember the story, man. Uh, our enemies, uh, they have a secret uranium facility, right? That means our enemies are about to get nuclear capability. And so Maverick is on a mission, and, and he's to, to take these 12 young pilots that have assembled, and, and he's to teach them and send them on a mission. That sounds like something I've heard before, that, that a great leader takes 12 people and puts them on an impossible mission. Sounds a little bit like Jesus and the disciples, but that's neither here nor there, right? And so, uh, man, the, the, um, do you remember the target for the uranium facility? It's, it's, it's in this mountainous, uh, and then and there's a crater. It's protected inside of this crater. And so uh, Maverick has, there's only one way that he thinks that he could train this team to, to uh, hit the target 
and to get out alive. And so here's what he says. He says, time is our greatest enemy. He says, we're going to have no more than two minutes and 30 seconds after we, we uh, hit the radars when the, the enemy interceptors are going to come and pursue us. Time is our greatest enemy. And so he says, because of that, we're, we're going to have to fly um, underneath uh, the radar for the, the uh, air, uh, anti-air missiles, anti-aircraft missiles. And so they fly. There's a, there's a ceiling of no higher than 100 feet in the air. By the way, you're going to be flying at 660 knots. That's 750 miles per hour. And so um, as you can see this, Finally, uh, Admiral Simpson, uh, he hears all this stuff and he says it's too reckless, it's too dangerous, he's looking for an excuse to get rid of Maverick, and, and sure enough, he does it. And then he, he gets the 12 uh, pilots back in the training room, and he says there's a new plan and a new mission. He says you can fly higher and slower now, and then you can, you're sure to safely hit your target. But the pilots are like, yeah, and then we're all dead. We're all sitting ducks. And then what happens in the training room? Suddenly, what the simulator um, path uh, flight map comes up behind the Admiral. Boop! And all of a sudden, you hear over the loudspeaker, this is Maveling, Maverick requesting uh, permission to take the test run, right? And so they're like, hey, you're not scheduled to do that. Well, sorry about that. I'm going. Now what? All the students in the room, they perk up a little bit. What in the world? And then they go, Maverick's like, set the timer for two minutes and 15 seconds. The students all gasp. That's impossible. <laughs> Man, Mav hicks it, and he starts running through, and, and as you can see him turning left, right, and the G-forces are, are beginning, they're, they're shaking him and shaking the plane, and it was funny, I was in the theater, I watched my wife, and he's going left, and she's going left, and right, and left, and right, and, and he's flying through, and they can see he's beating the time, until finally he gets through the course, and now he has to what? He has to uh, ascend vertically, such a sharp, uh, um, steep climb. Why? Because he has to climb over the crater. And so he hits it and he pulls the, the throttle all the way back. And as he rises, he, he, he crescendos, right? He crests and then his plane slowly rolls and falls and then it begins to plummet down towards the target. And as, as what, man, the target, the, the plane shake me and he can see slowly but surely, man, the target coming into range. And you hear this target locked on. Now they fast forward back into the student room. All the students are just leaning in like this and now the commanding officers officers they're still as can be wondering what's going to happen he goes target locked bombs away he lets it go and now what tom cruise aka maverick he has to make a 10g climb in order to ascend out of the cavern he pulls back the throttle all the way and he ascends uh five g's six g's seven g's do you know when you hit nine g's that all the blood flows out of your brain into your lower extremities causing you to pass out and so will he make it right and then as everyone's suspense filled you see the target explodes and that room explodes as Maverick had done it, man. Did I just wreck the movie for you or what, man? I remember I was, I was crying. I had tears in my eyes watching that thing. And I tell you that whole ridiculous thing to tell you this, that men and women, when they're on a mission and they have a purpose, it's riveting. You can't keep your eyes off of them. And Paul says, you and I are men and women on a mission from God. Paul says this, he says, I don't run aimlessly. He goes, see, he knew that God had given him a specific race, a purpose to fulfill for his life. And God has given you a specific race, a purpose for your life. Like, like do you remember the, the late great Steve Jobs? When he, he was approaching the Pepsi CEO, John Scully, he wanted to recruit him to come to Apple. Do you remember what he told him? Uh, Steve Jobs says this. He says, do you want to sell sugar water for the rest of your life? Or do you want to come with me and change the world? <laughs> it says that, that Scully, he, re, he said it, it felt like a, a punch in the gut to him. Why? Because he knew he was called to something great. You've been called to a great purpose. The purpose of the kingdom of God. 
Like I can remember, I had a similar conversation to that of Steve Jobs, except the dude talking to me wasn't a bajillionaire. But uh, there was a, a, a fellow pastor, as, uh, I wasn't a pastor at the time, I was still playing pro hockey, and this guy, John Blue, he, he kind of called me aside and he called me out and he, he asked me this question that really rocked me. He says, Adam, what are you doing for the kingdom of God? And that thing, it, it just hit me like a punch in the gut as well. And, and something shifted in my heart from that moment moving forward. Like I, I realized, man, I have a purpose and a mission from Almighty God. And it was at that moment I jumped into the story. I jumped into the game and began to play. And, and now I, I understand now, like I have a mission and a purpose from God. That God, God has called me to preach and teach the Bible and to lead leaders. And I wanna ask you this morning, what's your mission from God? What has God called you to do for his kingdom, right? You've been created for a purpose. Um, number three is this, it says that Barnabas, he was full of the Holy Spirit and a faith. Full of the Holy Spirit and a faith. And I wanna ask you this, what are you full of? Like, what are you full of this morning? Uh, Acts chapter 11, verse 23, remember, it says this. It says that, that when he came, he saw the grace of God. Like, like, you need to get this, that whenever Barnabas went, he was able to see the grace and the goodness of God all around him. Jesus will say it a little bit differently. He'll say this in, in Matthew chapter 6, uh, verse 22 to 23. It says, Jesus says this on the great Sermon on the Mount. It says, the eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light in you is darkness, how great is that darkness, right? See, what are you full of? Jesus is saying, man, what you focus on uh, in your life, it's going to fill you up on the inside. And so if you focus, man, if you're full of Twitter, CNN, Fox, here's what I know, that your life is going to be dark, dimly lit at best. All you're going to see, man, is, is loss and conflict. But, man, if you can train your eyes to see all that's good and right, you'll be full of light in life. Like, um, so we're approaching the Super Bowl, and I'm always curious about the halftime show, and, and to this day, I cannot be um, uh, swayed out of this, and if you were to speak otherwise, I would call it heresy, and I would kick you out of my church, okay? That the greatest uh, Super Bowl halftime show was that of Prince, okay? It was Super Bowl 41. They had the, the Chicago Bears against Peyton Manning and the Indianapolis Colt. Colts, and you remember it was it was in Miami, and there was this torrential downpour, this monsoon, and yet Prince was scheduled uh, to play at halftime. And so, actually, the handle, handlers and the producers of the halftime show they said, "Do you sure you want to go out there? It's dangerous with the wind and the rain." And he's like, "Absolutely." See, because like Prince, he didn't see rain; he saw purple rain, right? He didn't see obstacles; he saw opportunity in that moment. And you know what? It, it was such an amazing show that they, at the very end, uh, the producers, they said this, man, we have all witnessed something very, very special. See, what are you full of? What are you full of? Have you trained your eye to see all that's good and right? So uh, Martin Hanford, you, you don't realize this, but you know who he is. He's actually the creator of Waldo. If you remember the Where Is Waldo, Waldo book series where kids would try and find Waldo. And it's fascinating to hear um, why he did this. I'd like for, to read for you. He says this, uh, the author said that he hides Waldo so children can learn to be aware of what's going on around them. I'd like them to see wonder in places it might not have occurred to them. Part of what makes it hard to find Waldo is that he's so ordinary looking. See, I, I love that. He goes, they're trying to train, uh, train children to see wonder in places they never considered it could be. And, and how much more do we need to train our eye to see the grace of God and the goodness of God all around us? 
And so uh, there's, a, um, there's a woman, Peggy, uh, in my church, and I was just so thrilled and excited to see that, that, she, that she's exercising her eye to see what's good and right. And uh, as we entered into the new year, she just made a list uh, of 50 things that, that she's grateful for. And, and here's what you can see. I see that you can start with the simplest things, and I think you'll feel with me. She starts getting on a roll, right? And so she just starts writing down, thank you, God, for wisdom for being able to walk and talk, for eyesight, for hearing, God, for healing. Thank you for supernatural strength, for fresh mercies, for miracles, for peace, for family, for Pastor Adam and his family, yes and amen, for Pastor Dottie and Jimmy, uh, for Rejoice and Joyce, for beautiful and gentle Ethel. And she just goes on to list out all these friends and you can feel she's getting on this, this role of thanksgiving as her eyes becoming more and more keenly aware of what's right and what's good. And I would submit to you that, that there is a buffet of the goodness of God all around us each and every day if we'll just train our eyes to see all that's good and right. So it, it says this, that, that he was filled with the Holy Spirit, filled with the Holy Spirit. And so the Holy Spirit, uh, he's often called the helper. It's the word parakletos in the Greek. Para means alongside, kletos means to call. It, he's the one called alongside of us to help. And so uh, I'm just amazed. I'm a pastor and, and how, how often I just try to do things in my old own strength. I stumble along and then I remember, oh yeah, I hear the Holy Spirit say, hey, can I help? <laughs> so we, we had a, uh, a new, new man who had come to our church and you, I could tell he had really never been in church before, man. And he just had this stoic kind of mean look on his face. But man, after service, I was going to go track that guy down and, and try to somehow connect with him. And so I'm talking with him, trying to be the hockey player angle and then the hey, do you lift weights angle and all this different stuff. No, I'm, I'm exhausted trying to connect with this guy. Nothing. Until finally I just asked, hey man, can I pray for you? And I begin to pray and the Holy Spirit gave him a word. And that one word spoken over his life, this man began to break. He began to tear up. And guess what? He hasn't missed a service uh, since. The Holy Spirit, the helper. I remember my, my wife Susan we had, we had just retired uh, from the National Hockey League. There's a lot of uncertainty, and we just kind of felt uh, a little bit uh, like uh, vertigo, if you will. And so my wife was having a very difficult time. And as a husband, I, I was frustrated because there was nothing I could seem to do to help. And so, man, I was fasting and praying and crying out to God, and, and it seemed like nothing would work. And then we went to this prayer meeting, and we had, um, there, there was a man that prophesied over my wife four words. Four words. I won't tell you what those words are, but he spoke these four words over my wife and everything changed. Everything changed and shifted. Why? Because the helper uh, was helping us. I, um, there's, a, there's a pastor out of, uh, out of Texas. Uh, his name is Matt Chandler. I, I rip off all his stuff. And he, he told this really this, this gripping story of uh, um, actually, so, so he's, he's a Southern Baptist. And so with that, the, the Southern Baptists, they're not much about the Holy Spirit and gifts. And so he was very biblically serious, but he was spiritually skeptical. Man, the gifts and all that kind of stuff. He was very much, okay, let's be careful with that. But he had a friend, his name was Bob Hemp. And Bob Hemp, was kind of one of these crazy charismatics. And so Matt Chandler and his wife Lauren, uh, as young ministers, Bob says, hey, Matt, what is the Holy Spirit doing in your town? And he's like, we're like, Bob, you know, I, I don't know, seeking and saving the lost. That's what the Bible says. And he goes, no, no, personally, and, and right now, what is he doing? Let's go ask him. And so Chandler's like, okay, this is weird. And so they went back into Chandler's office and they asked the Holy Spirit, now, now Holy Spirit, what are you doing in our city? And then Bob says, the first things that come to mind, just write them down. And so Chandler, he says, the first thing that came to his mind was Whataburger, <laughs> was, was the Whataburger. And he says a specific one, it was one on Highway 23. And so uh, he, you know, he wrote down Whataburger, Highway 23. And then he just had this, this impression of a man uh, with uh, black pants and a blue shirt. 
and then he, this word popped into his mind, pigtails. <laughs> so he wrote down, uh, you know, black, uh, black pants, blue shirt, and then he wrote down pigtails. And he says, see, this is ridiculous. You guys are a bunch of crazy charismatics. And so uh, Bob goes, hey, well, let's just go to the Whataburger at US 23. And so he, he goes to the, they go to the Whataburger and it's like, man, no one there that fits that guy's description. And so, so Chandler's waiting in line to go get a burger and stuff for he and his wife. And, and, he, and he gets his order. And as he's got the tray, he turns around to go back to his table table and he sees the guy that fit the description that he talked about and he's like oh my gosh there's a guy with black pants and a blue shirt he goes back and he tells his wife Lauren that's the guy I think I think that's the guy and so so he's a little bit rigged out well this guy recognizes Bob Hemp and he says Bob I don't know if you remember me but you counseled to me and my family through the most difficult of times he goes you remember my daughter uh, she was the one who always wore pigtails and then he says, he says, sir, you need to come over with me. And he sat the man down and he says, Matt, show the man what you wrote down that the Holy Spirit sent you here for. And he opened up, he gave them the, the letter and he shows him that I was looking for a guy with black pants and a blue shirt and the word pigtails came to mind. And this guy just broke and began to weep because his daughter had, had drifted away from the Lord. She got into heavy drug use, and in fact was at, at the present time incarcerated for dealing drugs. Uh, her father took that piece of paper, showed it to her in the prison. She should broke down and rededicated her life to Jesus Christ. See, the Holy Spirit is constantly asking, can, can I help? Can I help? And the same Holy Spirit that helped him wants to help you and wants to help me filled with the Holy Spirit. And then lastly is this filled with faith. Filled with faith. So um, this shouldn't be uh, really too groundbreaking a uh, statement, but get this. Fear is free and faith takes work. Fear is free, faith takes work. I think you'll agree with me, like free, fear is free. It'll, it'll come, uh, it's always available, it'll come uninvited, and it'll fill your mind and terrorize your life. Like fear is, is free, and it, it, fear fights dirty. I don't know if you've ever paid attention to that, but, but there can be nothing in your present situation that's fearful, and then fear will dig up something from your past. Like you remember that time in elementary school when, it, when nobody liked you, Maybe no one's still going to like you, right? And these, just these ridiculous thoughts will bubble up from your past. And I want to encourage you, man, that if, if fear is going to fight dirty, we're going to fight dirty too. Because we can take our past and to fuel uh, our faith. Because the, the Bible is pretty clear that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the words of God. And so um, uh, if you're familiar with like your Old Testament, often you'll hear like in this nomadic time or there, was, there were shepherds that, that they would carry a staff with them. And this staff was not only for protection, but it was also uh, a, a form of history. And that these shepherds would, would etch in on their staff their, their family history and the miracles and the times that God showed up in their life and each time they would etch it so they could look at their staff and they could remember the miracles and the faithfulness of God. And so um, I know, uh, uh, you know, in, in my life, I, my, my mother just told me this past week that she said that I was born two months premature and so I spent the first month of my life in the hospital in an incubator. And she said, do you know that, um, that, that a cleaning lady uh, actually saw in the middle of the night that I wasn't breathing. And so she rushed and got one of the nurses and the nurses were able to save me. See, that's a, that's a little etch. God showed up in my life. Do you know, um, uh, there was a, a, a hockey partner, uh, uh, defense partner that I played in the NHL with. His name is Zarly Zalapsky. Um, do you know that uh, he's only a year older than me and a couple years ago he died of a heart condition. Uh, a very similar heart condition that I have. But God showed up in my life. It's like he's etching something. That, that, you know that there was a time when uh, we were planting this church. I had no idea what I was doing. And, and I just thought, I, just, I didn't know how we were ever going to make it. And yet here we are today and, and I'm speaking to you. See, that's, that's something that God has etched in the staff of my life. And I need to remember the faithfulness of God. 
So if you recall Moses, that Moses, he had to stand before the wicked Pharaoh and his dark magicians threw down their rods and they became a servant, serpent. But what did Moses do? God said, he says, you throw your staff down. The staff of the story of God, he threw it down and it became the serpent that swallowed up the dark, dark magicians, serpents. That, that Moses, when he, when he faced the Red Sea in front of him and the armies of Pharaoh behind, behind him, there, there was no way out and no way forward. But what did God say to do? He says, Moses, you lift up your staff. And there on that staff is the story of the faithfulness of God on his life. That David, the great psalmist, that, that David was going through a difficult and dark time. In fact, he wrote, though I walk through the va valley of the shadow of death, he says this, that your rod and what? Your staff, they comfort me. And then I'll end with this one in Mark chapter 6, verse 8. Jesus is sending out the 12 disciples. And notice what he says. He, he charged them and he said them to them, take nothing for their journey except a staff. He says, you don't need any bread, no bag, and no, buddy, no money, and no belt. Just the staff. The remembrance of the faithfulness of God will sustain you. And so um, faith, it comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And each time you take the word of God and you remember the faithfulness of God in, in other heroes' life, as you remember the faithfulness of God over your own life, let it etch in the staff of your heart this remembrance and let it build a steely faith on your life. And, um, and, then, and then lastly, notice this. It says, uh, it says that Barnabas... He went and he found Saul. He found Saul. And so here's what I want to challenge you. Um, see, Barnabas went out to look for his Saul. Who's your Saul? Like, like who is the person that, that man, you, you can run with that's going to challenge you and provoke you? And, and the two of you together are going to exponentially help grow the kingdom uh, of God. Who's your Saul? Like, um, it was funny, there's a, there's a guy in Manhattan, in my, my uh, church in Manhattan, his name is Chris Potter, a great guy, and Chris, um, he used to run the 800 uh, competitively. So for those of you that don't know what that is, that's two times uh, around a, an Olympic-sized track. And so uh, I am not that guy. I'm just like slow, 10-minute mile, that kind of dude, right? And so Chris, Chris wants me to train with him. And so, so we're running around Central Park, and he's doing, uh, we're doing uh, sprint jog intervals. Uh, it sounds real sexy. It's horrible. Um, what we would do is we would run six miles Jog a mile, sprint a mile, jog a mile, sprint a mile, and we do this until we reach six miles. Um, I was actively asking Jesus to kill me during this run, but I'm a guy running with him and I don't want him to see that I'm dying. Here we go, last mile, we need to sprint it. As we're going, man, I get that little stitch in your side thing, but, but I'm still going. And, and then at the, at the last kick, at the end of the sixth mile, uh, Chris looks at me and he's like, bro, we're almost there. He goes, you stay on my shoulder. I'm taking us home. And he kicked it and he ran so fast. And I got this supernatural strength that came on me. And we're running and running and we finished. And get this, our last uh, uh, time uh, and our final mile was quicker than our first mile. We had gone further and faster in that moment. Why? Because, man, we were pushing one another, sharpening one another. And that's what happens when you find your Saul. Do you know, um, there's a, um, it, it's why at church I'm constantly uh, pushing people to connect groups. Because, you know, in connect groups, you know what you're going to do? You're going to find your Saul in those groups. Uh, we like to do like gatherings in our church as well that just relationally people can eat food and, and talk and get to know each other because in that environment, you're going to meet uh, your Saul, right? And so uh, if you, once you find your Saul, man, they're going to challenge you and you're going to go deeper, stronger with the Lord than you ever imagined possible. And here's why that's so critical. You have a race to run. And I guess that's going to bring me back to the book of 1 Corinthians. Because some, some 2,000 years ago, Paul, he penned these words to the church at Corinth. It was his pump-up speech to encourage them. Man, that, that you're going to go faster and further than you ever imagined. And he penned these words, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 24 to 27. Paul says this. He says, Do you not know 
that in a race all the runners run, but only one receives the prize. So run that you may obtain it. Every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. So I do not run aimlessly, and I do not box as one beating the air. But get this, I discipline my body and keep it under control, lest after preaching to other, others, I myself should be disqualified. Let's pray. Uh, Lord, I just I thank you for this time that we could spend together. And Lord, I pray just above all, Lord, that you're doing a work in the hearts of men and women. God, I pray that they would see that you have this great run uh, set aside for their life. Specifically, each man and woman that are hearing this, God has a plan, a purpose, and a destiny for you. Lord, I pray that, God, you would use us to be great exhorters, people that would encourage uh, other people, that, that we would um, live our life on purpose. Oh, Lord, like Barnabas, we'd be full of the Holy Spirit and of faith, and that we'd all find our Saul. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, every nation. Well, listen, uh, God bless you, man. The sermon's over. We're not quite finished because I would like to remind you that you can be faithful in your tithing and your giving. I want to say thank you to those that, that have uh, sown into our church. We're so grateful to Jesus uh, for your giving. And so uh, there's three ways you can give uh, uh, digitally. You can go to our website, encnj.org, and just hit the giving icon. Or you can give via text. If you just text the letters ENCNJ to the number 77977, it's a very convenient way to give. That's the way my family and I give. Or you can mail in your check or money order right here to our church offices at 101 Gibraltar Drive right here in Morris Plains, New Jersey. And may God richly and abundantly bless you and care for you as you're faithful in your giving. Every nation, Jesus loves you, and I think you're pretty amazing too. Have a fabulous week. I'm a